All right, start recording. Awesome. So, yeah, welcome to the computer vision reading group. This will be the first session. Um, you know, obviously these groups would uh, is is going to cover a lot of breadth. Um, you know, depending on you know how how much experience you have with computer vision, um, you might be able to contribute or not to the discussion a lot. But by the end of it, I hopefully everyone sort of knows a thing or two about uh, the field, right? And so. Uh, this session would be going over the introduction of this reading group, you know, just the goals, uh, what we hope to accomplish uh, through this reading group, and then we'll, f uh, we'll get started with uh, the task of image recognition and the type of models uh, that are sort of done uh, using them. Um, so yeah, the overview, uh, just as an overview, this reading group is going to be very breath heavy, right? Computer vision is a very big field. Um, normally when people say they do computer vision, usually they specialize in a specific field. Um, hopefully we can cover as much as possible. Um, and another thing I want to mention before is uh, this reading group will be deep learning focused, right? There's uh, computer vision has gone way back before um, this whole deep learning boom in the past ten years. But you know, a lot of the state of the art in computer vision right now is focused around deep learning, uh, using deep learning techniques uh, to create these methods, right? So we will be focusing more on state of the arts, uh, right? And um, if you're interested in more of the fundamentals, more of the classical uh, side of computer vision, uh, feel free to take CS 484. Uh, since 84, if you're you know if you're in the math department, or I'm pretty sure uh, pretty much anyone can take this as long as you fulfill the uh, prereqs. Um, this course is obviously not as deep learning heavy, but it will go more into the uh, nitty gritty you know fundamentals of computer vision, which I'd say are equally as as exciting. Um, but yeah, the goal of this reading group is just to give you a working knowledge of all the different areas of computer vision, right? And then resources will be provided on the end of these slides, um, you know, for more depth if you're curious, right? Say, like, I mentioned something that you're very interested in, um, I will provide some links at the end of these slides at each session uh, that should give you a starting point on where to look if you want to read more into it. Um, another thing about these uh, reading groups is at the end of every session, we will also have like a take home project, right? This is obviously totally optional, um, but the goal is that it should give you some hands on experience should you want to do it of the different topics. Um, and obviously, this is another extra side project for the resume, right? Obviously, a machine learning project looks really good on the resume, I'd say. Um, that being said, you know, I will propose an idea on you know, what we could do, um, and I will provide the template code and the data set. And that being said, the GPU is not provided. Um, you can use uh, Google Colab, uh, you know, run it in GPU mode, and it does quite well as well. And, and I mean, it trains pretty fast too. So I wouldn't be too concerned about not having GPUs at hand. Um, right, so the meetings are supposed to uh, be bi-weekly um, on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. I know it's a Monday, uh, 7 p.m., um, you know, a little sh uh, issue uh, last week, but um, Starting from next week, it will be we will be meeting bi-weekly on Tuesdays, right? And depending on everyone, uh, we could choose to move this to in-person if there's enough interest. Uh, because I heard that recently uh, we're allowed to host uh, on uh, on-campus events again, uh, which is quite exciting. So at the end of this session, I'll just uh, ask everyone um, if they're okay with you know if they're down to uh, move this to in-person, right? Obviously, some people are on co-op, they're remote. So if that's the case, then we'll probably just keep this. Uh, virtual, uh, but regardless whether it's in person or not, uh, I will be recording each session and posting onto the YouTube. Um, so just to get started, um, we have to first really define what is computer vision. So I found this link, uh, this definition off of Wikipedia. I think it does a pretty good job. To summarize, computer vision is an interdisciplinary scientific field that deals with how computers can gain high-level understanding from digital images or videos. Right. So in other words, it basically seeks to understand and automate tasks that the human visual system can do. Right. I think a TLDR is basically we're trying to create these machines, these software that can mimic uh, the human visual system and you know how we understand images. So that's the main idea of computer vision. As you can see, you know, it can be quite broad. Um, so we'll be talking about a few tasks and uses of computer vision. Um, the most obvious one is recognition and detection. We've probably all seen this one before, you know, the MNIST classification on uh, of uh, handwritten digits. Um, but basically what it is, so say you have an image, right, um, you want to detect what is inside the image and you want to classify it, right? So say you have an image of a cat, you want your model to output, oh, this is a cat. 
you can obviously make this task a lot more complicated because oftentimes in images you have multiple objects and instances of an object or, or class um, and you have many different classes within the image, right? So what you might want to do is you might want, might want to detect where each of these objects are and also classify it, right? So what we have here in this image is a bunch of these uh, bounding boxes, right? Each color corresponds to a class um, and basically what this uh, model was able to do was not only detect where the objects were, but also classify what was inside the, this bounding box. Uh, basically, what object uh, it, it created bounding box around. All right, so that's the idea of recognition and detection. Um, and then there's this is more. Uh, this is other idea of segmentation, right? Um, I'd say that segmentation is a more you know it's a more stronger form of recognition. Basically, what you're trying to do now is you're trying to classify each pixel as part of an object, right? So let's let's take the image on the left of this brain CT scan, right? So let's say you want to create a model that's able to detect tumors or something, right? And it's able to segment out where exactly these tumors are. Um, so what it might do is it might just uh, label all of the pixels that correspond to tumor uh, as red, as you've seen in this image, right? And the same can be said. Um, in this image of a street view on the right, um, so you know if you take the example of a vehicle, right, of a car, maybe you want you're gonna want to label all of the pixels that in the image that correspond to a car as red, right? And at the end, what you have is the segmentation mask uh, down below. So it's a very colorful thing, right? And it turns out the segmentation is actually very useful. Um, it's often used in conjunction with recognition detection. Uh, we might get into it uh, a bit later. However, I'd say one of the most exciting use cases that has emerged recently is uh, combining segmentation with image synthesis. Right? So what image synthesis is, it's very straightforward. So let's say you have two images, right? You want to combine them together to form something, form this new image, right? And this is done a lot in uh, generative models. Um, how can you use segmentation uh, for this task? Well, say you train a model to segment, um, you know, uh, like maybe it might be like a picture of a landscape. Right, so it might be able to segment out the water, the sky, and trees. Um, right, so you get this segmentation mask on the top row right here, um, and you also want to combine that with a different style, right? And that that's like these uh, this leftmost column, right? So each correspond to a different style of the image, right? So um, you're going to train a model that combines the masking and you know your your style image reference uh, and forms a completely new image. With the objects from your segmentation mask, but in the style of uh, the style that I gave it, right? So these are some examples, right here. Um, you know, obviously uh, this is not the only use case to generate uh, new images of landscape. Uh, there's a lot more practical uses, I'd say. Um, one of the most common ones I say is um, so let's let's say that you know you're starting an e-commerce business, right? And you sell clothes. Um, if you're gonna sell clothes online, you're probably gonna need pictures of models wearing your clothing items, right? Um, but that means you're probably gonna have to, you know, uh, outsource these models. You know, uh, rent a studio, rent photographers, hire photographers um, to take these images, right? And it could take a very long time. It could be very costly. It'd be better if you could, uh, you know, train a model to sort of just generate these images on these. Uh, someone joined. Let me add them. All right. Welcome. Um, so, like I said, yeah, it might be better if you could train a model, right, to detect, uh, you know, uh, the semantic features of it. So, uh, you know, uh, if you look at this top left corner here, um, you have this mask, right? It's able to segment out, you know, the hair, the face, uh, the upper clothes, and the pants, right? And using this mask, combining it with another image, this reference image of the style of clothing you want the model to wear, you can form, you can generate a new image of the model wearing the item piece, right? So this is very flexible, um, and you, you know, anytime you get like a new, uh, a new collection of clothing, you don't have to hire more models to take more pictures, right? You could just pass it through this uh, generative model. Um, the same thing can be said uh, with like uh, images of like natural images, right? So of the street. So let's say you have an image of the street and you want to add a tree, or maybe like add some cars into the image. Um, you know, you can combine that with some segmentation mask. And then uh, from using that, uh, you're able to generate this new image with uh, the objects desired, right? And the same thing can be said where, let's say you want to add a bed to a room in the image, right? Uh, you just, you know, uh, kind of scribble where you want the bed to be, 
right? And then uh, pass it through your model, and then it's able to generate a bed in that position. All right, so that's the main idea of image synthesis. Um, this image right here was actually taken from this paper called Semantically Multimodal Image Synthesis. It was published into CVPR uh, last year. Um, just so you guys know, uh, when I do mention these conferences like CVPR, CVPR is probably the most prestigious conference for computer vision, uh, right? So if you're if you work in computer vision research, you probably want to be publishing into that. Um, so it's a good place to look for you know what's what's really out there, what's the state of the art um, in computer vision, right? And so we just mentioned a bunch of tasks for 2D images. You can obviously obviously generate this uh, generalize this idea into 3D computer vision. Right? So instead of a 2D image, what you might have is, let's say, a point cloud. A point cloud, what it is, it's basically just a list of x, y, z tuples, right? That kind of, uh, that kind of are kind of just a bunch of points in this three-dimensional space, right? And uh, when you kind of uh, map all these points into your space, uh, it forms uh, you know, the structure of an object, right? And so um, it's pretty, pretty, basically it's like a, th a 3D object now, right? And you can do the same thing, you know, you could do your classification task, you could do segmentation, uh, so part segmentation and semantic segmentation. Uh, just in case you guys are curious, what's the difference between part segmentation and semantic segmentation? Recall in uh, like semantic segmentation, what we did was we basically just classified each, uh, segmented each object, but you could, you could take that one step further and also uh, classify the parts on each object, right? So let's take this example of an airplane, you could segment, you could pretty much classify oh, these are the wings of the airplane, or this is the body of the airplane, right? So it's pretty much this finer idea of semantic segmentation, but they're more or less the same thing, and you can combine pretty much the same uh, mo models and methods on both. And then, you know, we can take it one step further, and then we can combine two-dimensional deep learning, uh, see our, our computer vision into three-dimensional computer vision, right? So right here is this work by NVIDIA. Uh, you know, they do a lot of great work in CV. Um, and it was published in Europe uh, two years ago. Basically, what they did introduce was, you know, if you have a 2D image uh, of, like, let's say, a car or an object, you're able to generate, like, a 3D reconstruction of the, the object, right? And so how they sort of do it is they have an inference network that they pre-trained um, uh, to map these input images into a mesh, right? So a mesh is 3D, right? And it's basically a point cloud at that point. Um, it's able to uh, predict the texture, the lighting, um, and then what, using these features, you pass it into this differentiable renderer, right? And then uh, from that, you're able to uh, generate these 3D reconstructions of uh, the object in your 2D image, right? And it's very cool. Um, if you look at the blog post uh, posted by these authors, um, you're able to actually rotate this image around, you know, you have this full 3D reconstruction of this 2D input image, uh, which is quite exciting. And we'll be talking more about it. Um, this whole idea of differentiable rendering. Um, it's been pretty, uh, I, I'd say it's pretty like cutting edge uh, just because you know, uh, you're able to train uh, a, a renderer uh, to generate uh, whatever you want. So that's quite exciting. Um, so yeah, I think before we go even further, uh, we should just outline the, the talks um, and the pretty much topics we will be talking about. So. This is the first session. We're going to be talking about image recognition and detection. You know, we'll just be going over uh, j some very broad classes of CNNs. You know, VGG, ResNet, and NetsNets. Um, we'll be talking about region detection models, so like the RCNN family, right? Uh, and then we'll be talking about you know the classic and state-of-the-art task and benchmarks that you could you know uh, test your models on. And the take-home project this week will be very straightforward. It'll, it'll be very simple. Um, it's just image classification on CIFAR 10, but it's supposed to you know hopefully get uh, the people who are newer to this are uh, more familiar with PyTorch and how to do you know, uh, machine learning programming, I'd say. So uh, next week, uh, November 2nd, uh, next Tuesday, uh, we will be talking about segmentation and self-supervised pre-training. Um, these two ideas are kind of disjoint, right? They don't really uh, overlap too much. But you know, uh, we'll be talking about segmentation first, uh, right? We'll be talking about DeepLab V3 unit, medical image segmentation, and then street view segmentation. And then we'll be talking about contrastive learning, which is this new idea. Where it's not really new, but it was only recently where people have shown that it works really well in self-supervised pre-training, right? And the goal of this is to make um, to use contrastive learning to hopefully make uh, Google reverse image search, right? That's the goal. 
Um, and you know, uh, to tie in uh, segmentation, I'm also going to be providing some code, um, you know, for uh, segmentation of retina vessels. So this ties into medical image segmentation. Okay. Um, so the third week, November 16th, we'll be talking about generative models. So generative models aren't really like, uh, I wouldn't say generative models are a subset of computer vision. However, there's a lot of overlap in the sense that, you know, when people come up with this new method in generative modeling, they usually test it on uh, some computer vision tasks, like generating images, uh, generating uh, images of like uh, handwritten digits, for example, that's a common one. Um, so we'll be talking about the models that are used, right? So VAEs, uh, GANs, normalizing flows. Uh, we'll be and then we'll be talking about the methods and the applications, right? So one that you've already seen so far is image synthesis. Uh, we'll also be talking about style again, um, which is very similar to image synthesis, and you know, stochastic so, so differential editing, and then data set again. And the take-home project this week will be to uh, build a conditional generative model, right? Uh, which is very exciting. And then you know, the last week before your exams, you know, there, there probably won't be a uh, a take-home project, um, you know, uh, but what we will cover is, you know, 3D computer vision, right, how do we deal with meshes and point clouds, um, you know, there's a lot of interesting work in the visual language interplay, right, so, you know, you have this image and you have uh, a text, how can you use those two uh, inputs together to achieve a certain task, right, and this is done a lot in visual question answering, right, so say you have an image and you have a question, um, you want to train a model that's able to answer the question based on the image, right? And then we'll be talking about weekly semi and self-supervised learning. Um, that's been pretty big in uh, computer vision recently. Uh, we'll be talking about neural radiance fields, right? This is a lot more complex. And lastly, we'll be talking about vision transformers. Um, vision transformers, I'd say it's, it's a pretty crazy idea. Uh, it's been introduced last year. Basically, they take the transformer model from NLP, and they basically say, you know, if you feed patches of an image, um, it's able to pretty much do just as well as any convolutional model out there, uh, which is quite bizarre, but I'm not surprised because of this whole boom in attention is all you need uh, recently. Um, so any questions so far before we get started on just the basis of convolutional networks and the models? No? Okay. Um, so, you know, for the people who are newer here, um, Hopefully, I can give you guys a TLDR of the building blocks of what makes a CNN a CNN, right? So we now first introduce this idea of convolutions, and it's a very uh, wide known uh, concept that's used a lot in mathematics, signal processing. Um, in the continuous case, um, I think this image does a really good job, right? So say you have this red box and you slide it across uh, this domain, and this line right here that's sort of formed. Uh, basically measures the amount of overlap between these two boxes, right? So what we say is we're convolving this red box across uh, the domain, right? And in, in that case, you know, it, it overlaps with the blue box. Um, turns out you could discretize it, right? It's the same idea. So um, this yellow sliding window, right? It's three by it's a three by three matrix. Uh, we call that a kernel, and in the kernel, it's basically just a matrix with a bunch of real valued entries, right? Uh, typically, we use a three by three kernel. And basically what you do at each field of view, uh, you compute an element-wise multiplication uh, with your image, right? And the image is just in green right here. Well, after you do the element-wise uh, multiplication, you sum up the values, and then you get your convolved feature uh, for that respective field of view, right? And the whole idea of CNNs uh, and these convolutional layers is, you know how like in uh, feed forward neural networks, we're basically just trying to learn the edge weights? Um, in CNNs, we're, we're just trying to learn these kernel entries, uh, the values of, of these kernel entries, right? So these are the weights we're trying to learn. And you can imagine, you know, if you have a, the identity matrix as your kernel, uh, right? So just a bunch of ones along the diagonal. Um, this is basically a, a, a diagonal edge detector, right? So anytime in the image, uh, this diagonal edge, it will overlap with the kernel, right? And then the value, the convolved feature value will be very large, right? And now you're probably asking, why do we want to use convolutions? Well, the reason is simple. Um, in images, we need a lot of weight sharing um, because images have features that might be universal across the entire image, right? Like I said, diagonal edge detection. And so, you know, um, let's take the naive example of uh, we, we're just using a feed forward neural network, right? And all we do is we, we assign each pixel with a weight and we pass that through the, uh, the neural network, right? And say you want you train it on this image of a cat many times, 
right? And it's able to finally detect, oh, this is a cat. Um, afterwards, what if you shift the the Im the uh, the cat uh, to the left a bit, right? Inside this red circle, um, the cat is no longer there, or at least the defining features of a cat, right? So your feed forward neural network probably won't be able to classify it as a cat um, because the weights that learn to cut because the weights that you learned uh, were just uh, corresponding to uh, this region in the red, right? Uh, but if, obviously, if you shift or like rotate your image of the cat. Um, it won't be the same anymore. All right, so that's why you want to use convolutions because now you just slide your weights across the entire image and it's pretty much able to detect anything uh, regardless of you know if it's translated, rotated, uh, whatever the case may be. All right, so that's why you use this uh, convolutional layers um, for images. All right, and then now we need to introduce this idea of channels. Um, very intuitively, you know, to form any image uh, or at least colored image. Um, we, we have this idea of RGB, right? So red, green, blue um, channels. So the red channel will just be a matrix of corresponding to uh, you know pixel values, and then each uh, pixel value will pretty much tell you how much red is in that pixel, right? And the same can be said for green, the same can be said for blue. And the idea is once you uh, combine, uh, sum them up, right? Some of the red, green, blue values together, you're able to form pretty much any color you want, right? Because the idea is red, green, blue, they can make any or any, any linear combination of these three colors can make any color on the visible spectrum. Right? We, we could take this one step further because uh, CNN's kind of generalized this notion of channels. So now, as opposed to just having red, green, and blue, um, we could have just arbitrary number of channels, right? and each channel might correspond to something different. Right? Um, as for what it corresponds to, we probably don't know too well. Uh, that, that's a whole other field of deep learning called interpretability. Uh, however, uh, to give you some intuition, you know, say you're training a CNN to detect cats, right? So one of the channels may be uh, specific to detecting, you know, the whiskers of a cat or let's say the eyes of a cat. While you know another channel may be uh, uh, specifically the features of, you know, diagonal features or let's say the tail of the cat or something like that, right? So that's the idea of channels. Um, you basically map your, you know, your Three channel image RGB image into ar an arbitrary number of images, right? And then that's supposed to capture a lot of semantic features of your image, um, right? And so we also have to introduce this idea of pooling because you can imagine, um, you know, you convolve your features, you map it to a bunch of different channels, right? And like let's take this example, right? So you have a thirty-two by thirty-two uh, image, right? And there's only one channel, so it's a grayscale image. And then you map this to this 32 by 32 by 8 uh, uh, feature map, right? And so that means there's eight channels. So that just meant, you know, the number of dimensions, the total number of uh, uh, pixels uh, in your uh, feature uh, map increased by eight, right? Which is not good because then it's not very scalable. And also, uh, you probably don't want to keep every single uh, uh, pixel information. Right, so we have to reduce, do some dimensionality reduction. So there's these two ideas uh, that's very commonly used. Uh, one's called mass pooling, the other one's called average pooling. Right. So once again, we have this field of view. Right. We could think of this as a two by two kernel. Um, and basically, at, in each field of view, for mass pooling at least, you take the maximum. Right. And then you you uh, you pretty much that becomes the feature of your net's uh, feature map. Right. And you then you, you move this. Uh, feature map, uh, this kernel by two, right? So you, you, you get another disjoint uh, field of view, and then you do the same thing, right? And then at the end of it, you end up shrinking your entire feature map by two, uh, which is a good thing, right? And the same thing can be done, but for averaging, right? So you just take the average within the field of view, um, you slide that across your image, and then you get the, uh, the, the, the final feature map. Uh, that's a reduced dimension, right? And turns out, you know, if you're wondering which one do you want to use, max pooling or average pooling, honestly, the results are pretty similar. Um, I think depending on your task, you're going to have to just play around with it, see which one gets a better accuracy. Um, but pretty much, uh, you can't go wrong with either one. Right? And so now that we have this notion of uh, convolutional layers, right, the sliding windows, uh, we have this idea of uh, uh, pooling that reduces the dimensions of your feature maps. Um, lastly, what you might want to do is, at least for classification, uh, you want to be able to uh, train something that's able to, uh, you know, classify an image into this discrete, uh, uh, discrete bins, uh, so to speak. 
right? And so um, what people often do is after they reduce their feature maps to a certain dimension, so like in this example, it's 40, 4 by 4 and there's only 16 channels, uh, what they might do is they might just flatten all the dimensions, right? So stack all of the features into a single vector. Um, and then you feed this vector, right? This vector ends up being uh, 256 dimensions because 4 times 4 times 16 is 256. And then you feed that into, let's say, uh, a feed forward neural network, right? What people might also do is they might just train an SVM to uh, detect the, the, the hard margin uh, or whatnot. But either way, um, you're going to want to add like some uh, task specific uh, layers afterwards uh, to achieve whatever you want. Uh, whatever you're trying to, whatever data set you're working with, right? And so um, combining everything together, uh, we're going to first introduce the very first uh, CNN out there, I'd say. Um, it's called VGG. Um, this was introduced like back in like 2013, 2014. Um, it's very straightforward, honestly. It's pretty much what we've already seen um, in this previous image, right? So you have like a 224 by 224 uh, image. It's RGB. Um, and then you... Uh, basically just use a 5 by 5 uh, kernel, right? Um, in this paper, you know, the authors use 5 by 5 kernels. Later on, uh, people say that you don't need to use 5 by 5 kernels. It's a waste of resources. It's a lot more memory. And it's not as memory efficient, right? You can just use 3 by 3 and it does just as well, um, if not better. Um, and yeah, it's pretty much the standard CNN architecture that we all already know. However, it turns out that these models, they don't work so well. Uh, because you know you can't make them very deep. Um, so the running meme, I'd say the running joke in uh, deep learning is if your model is shallow and it's not performing too well, um, you just stack more layers, right? And so you know we have this meme. Uh, you know, in statistical learning people are very particular about what they're trying to do. However, in neural networks, you know, if your model is not performing well, one thing you could try is just add more layers, right? That increases the modeling ca capacity. Of, of your model, right? And hopefully that translates to it does better. And this is kind of analogous to um, this idea in mathematics um, where let's say I give you um, n lines, right? And I want you to form a circle. So if you have only three lines, the best you can do is make a triangle. If you have four lines, the best you can do is make a square, right? And the same can be said if you have for five, you make a pentagon, and so on and so forth. However, as you know, n approaches infinity, you get closer and closer to making a circle. Right, uh, and you should think of you know uh, each line as like maybe a layer or uh, you know a, a number of the, the width of your of your model, and as you increase it, you're pretty much able to model your data set a bit better. Right, obviously this doesn't mean you know if you have infinite layers or infinite width, your model does infinitely well. You know you don't you don't just achieve 100% accuracy like that uh, because. Uh, we often deal with finite data sets, right? Uh, you're probably going to e end up overfitting on your data set, right? So what overfitting means, if, for those who are not uh, aware, um, overfitting just means, you know, you do really well on your data set, but on some test data set, on some testing set, you perform really poorly, right? Because on the, te on the training data set, it was only able to learn features that doesn't generali generalize well uh, to the testing uh, set, right? And so... Um, tying this back in, you can't make VGGs very deep, um, so that's that's where this idea of ResNet came in. Um, I know one of uh, the attendees of this uh, reading group, they actually do research in ResNets, which is very cool. Um, ResNets, what they do is, you know, you have your standard uh, convolution, convolutional layers, right? It's represented by your weights, uh, this ReLU, and then a weight layer. Uh, so it's just your typical convolutional uh, layers, and then um, Unlike what people have done before, you also introduce the skip connection, right? And so in the end, all you do is add the, the skip connection, so the identity mapping, plus the convolved features uh, of your original image, right? And um, to give you a recursive form, um, it's it's like this. So x uh, k plus one is equal to x k plus f k uh, f x k, and f is just your your uh, convolutional layers, right? And so the idea is we only need to learn f at each layer. Um, the real reason why this works really well is because you have strong gradient flow. Um, so, you know, in, uh, with back propagation, when you back propagate gradients, um, typically, you know, you're doing a lot of like multiplication. And that's just due to the nature of the back propagation and the chain rule, right? And oftentimes your gradients are very small, so they're like less than one, 
what happens if you multiply a bunch of numbers less than one together? Um, they start to approach zero, right? So that's not good because now you know um, you want to update your weights based on uh, based on uh, your gradient size. However, if it's close to zero, then your weights aren't really updated, right? So your model en actually ends up not learning too fast. So it ends up converging very slowly. Um, however, with this uh, identity uh, flow, uh, with this uh, skip connection, um, you know, this gradient flows through the identity path and they are added with the gradients from the f of x path, from the convolutional path, right? So this, is, this means that you're not as likely to have vanishing gradients because of this additive uh, flow of the gradients. Um, and so this also just directly means you know you can make your model much deeper. Uh, to give you an, a picture, a visual uh, idea of what's going on, so on the left uh, you have VGG19, this is how deep it goes, right? And then even here um, it started to overfit on like some classic data sets. However, with the ResNet um, on your very right, you introduce these skip connections, right? Um, in this image, it's only 34 layer layers, however, you can make this much deeper. Um, I think the uh, one that's available in PyTorch or TorchVision is ResNet 152. So that, mean, that means there's 152 layers. Um, yeah, and so you can make this a lot more deeper than you know, the VGG counterpart, counterpart just because you know, uh, of this idea of uh, strong gradient flow through the identity uh, path. And to give you another, I, I guess, intuition as to why uh, ResNets work so well is um, Let's say like you're halfway through your computation, right, in, in your forward pass, so you're, you're like just about here. Um, and the, the feature map you have is already close to optimal, right? In the, in the, uh, using other methods, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to reconstruct the optimal feature map every single uh, layer, uh, every, every, other, every layer uh, afterwards, right? However, um, with this ResNet, uh, it's much easier to learn f, uh, f is just the zero mapping, right? As opposed to learn the exact same mapping, the identity mapping, right? So that's kind of why ResNets also work so well. Uh, you know, it's kind of been observed in the past. Um, and then we're going to be talking about, uh, we're going to introduce this model called DenseNet. DenseNet basically just takes ResNet and puts it on steroids. Uh, it takes it one step further. So uh, you know how in ResNet we only pass the, the features, uh, you know, uh, one step further? Now DenseNet passes the features uh, every to every single uh, 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 time step afterwards, right? So you're basically just combining all of these features from the past. And, you know, the idea is uh, at a certain layer, you know, it might correspond to certain features you learned. And that might be very useful later on. So that's why you feed it forward uh, into every single other layer. Uh, afterwards. However, you can imagine that dense nets, they can be quite uh, complex to model just because, and it might be, you know, not so memory efficient, uh, just because you have uh, all of these uh, feed forward connections, right? And so this is an example of just a dense net with three dense blocks, right? And then, you know, it's just uh, how it might look like if you're trying to train a dense net uh, for object detection. And, you know, lastly, um, you know, the theory is all nice and good. However, you, you guys are probably wondering how do we implement this. Um, if you want to implement this, you know, you're probably going to have to read the paper or read some source code. Um, but if you're more so curious on how can you use these models, uh, the good thing is in the uh, library Torch Vision, it's already all implemented for you, right? So pretty much this is just very plug and play. Uh, you could pretty much adapt this for any data set you want, and it's very flexible. So this is a very good resource, I'd say. Um, the Torch Vision dataset or, or the library. And now I think we are ready to the, uh, introduce you guys to some classic data sets that are used, right? Because with the models, we're going to have to use these models, these models on something, right? Um, for image recognition and detection, um, you know, the most basic ones are MNIST and CIFAR 10. The reasons why these are the most basic ones, you know, we, we like to say this is the hello world of computer vision um, just because these images are very small. Right, so MNIST, uh, the images are 28 by 28 pixels squared, and they're all grayscaled, right? So there's only one channel. Um, we have 60,000 samples, and there's only 10 classes, right? So it's very straightforward. So given an image of a handwritten digit, you train a model to classify which one, uh, which digit it is. Um, you can take it one step further uh, and use uh, RGB images, 
right? Um, and so uh, if you want to do that, you're going to use CIFAR 10. CIFAR 10, it's a bunch of 32 by 32 uh, pixel squared RGB images, right? So we have three channels now. Uh, just like MNIST, it also has 60,000 samples. And just like MNIST, it also has 10 classes, right? And the 10 classes, uh, have, it, you know, it might be a truck, ship, frog, dog. Uh, it's just basically a bunch of objects and animals. And so for this week, uh, for the project, you know, I have, I wrote the code for MNIST. Um, but it's, uh, but the challenge is now, uh, can you guys adapt this code for CIFAR 10? Uh, there's actually a few changes you have to make that are quite subtle. Um, and hopefully that should give you a better understanding of how to uh, do some, you know, uh, code in code some code in PyTorch, and you know, do some computer vision uh, hands on. And then there's this data set called ImageNet. Um, it's a very large data set. A lot of people use it for baselining, right? So in the ResNet and uh, DenseNet papers, and also VGG, um, they actually tested their methods on ImageNet. Um, it actually has over 14 million uh, natural images, right? And it contains over 20,000 classes. You must be wondering, how do you train a model to be able to just uh, recognize 20,000 classes? Uh, the thing is, you don't. Uh, people often just take subsets of ImageNet, right? There's actually a few popular subsets of ImageNet, um, right? However, ImageNet, it's still an ever-growing uh, data set. People are still adding to it, contributing to it. Uh, once they have like a, well, you just need people to, you know, given an image, you just need someone, a human to uh, pretty much uh, label the image and then you add it into your data set. Right, and so the thing about ImageNet is that the image size varies. Right, so previously in MS and CIFAR 10, we had these 28 by 28 images and 32 by 32 images. In ImageNet, it varies a lot. Right, it might not just be a square anymore; it might be rectangles. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to need to pad and crop uh, these images to a certain shape just for a CNN to work. Um, right, so if you're training a CNN on a data set, um, all of the images have to be of the same dimensions. Right, they all have to be like 100 pixels by 100 pixels. Uh, right, otherwise it won't work well. Um, and lastly, you know, this is the go-to data set for a lot of image classification algorithms. Um, and nowadays, it's used a lot in, I'd say, self-supervised learning uh, for computer vision. Um, so there's also this data set called Celebrity A. Um, once again, it's a bunch of 64 by 64 pixel squared images. There's there's approximately over 200,000 images. Right, and there are 40 attributes. The difference between Celebrity A and every other uh, data set you've seen is that these attributes are multi hot right? So these features can co-occur. Because you can have a person with eyeglasses, and they also have bangs, and they also have an oval face, right? So it's not just a wet hot vector uh, as your labels now, it's like a multi hot vector, right? So whichever feature, whatever features, uh, indices in your, uh, in your, in your uh, label vector correspond to eyeglasses, it'll be uh, one if the if the object is if the if the person is wearing eyeglasses, and the same can be said for bangs and so on and so forth, right? So this is a very interesting data set uh, that's used a lot in generative modeling and it's also used in sometimes you know in in uh, detection and classification. Uh, so um, you know earlier uh, before I started this session, I, I showed you guys guys this image of uh, you know, a model that's able to detect a bunch of different objects, right, uh, and instances of these objects. Uh, however, previously what we saw is a bunch, uh, these data sets that are only able to classify each entire image as one uh, class, right? So the idea is how can we uh, generalize this idea of detection into multiple objects in an image? Because oftentimes that's a lot more useful. Right, you can imagine self-driving cars, you need to detect multiple, multiple objects and classify them. And so um, that's where this idea of region CNNs come in. Uh, region CNNs, they were actually introduced like back in 2014. And the idea is actually quite straightforward. Uh, basically what you do is you run this algorithm called selective search. Um, it's kind of brute force, I'd say, but it, it kind of uh, you know, uh, goes across your entire image and proposes a bunch of regions where an object might actually be. Right? And there's a few different uh, algorithms uh, for selective search, uh, but the general class is called selective search. Right? And each time you have a, uh, a region proposal, uh, you're going to feed the proposed uh, region into a CNN, right? so this convolutional neural network. And then afterwards, you know, you're going to just classify what was, ever, what was inside that region. You can imagine that this could get very, uh, uh, this, this is not very efficient. 
because every time you propose the region, uh, or every time the algorithm proposes a region, you don't have to uh, pass the uh, pass the image through uh, a CNN, right? And so that's a lot of extra computations. And a lot of the times, you know, the 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 region it proposes, there's actually nothing in there, right? Um, and so it's a lot of wasted computation. Uh, so the question is, can we do better? And the answer is yes. What you can do instead is you can reverse uh, the process. Instead, you could just feed your image into a CNN, right? Get these feature maps, um, that, and it also reduces the, the dimensions of the image, right? And then you perform your selective search algorithm on these feature maps, right? Uh, once you propose a bunch of regions, uh, or once you propose a bunch of regions in your feature map, uh, you pass that into, you know, maybe a fully uh, convolutional or fully connected neural network uh, afterwards to do the classification. The reason why this is a lot more efficient is because you just went from 100, 1,000 by 600 uh, pixel squared image to 60 by 40, right? So there's a lot less proposals, um, and it's a lot more efficient now. Um, and now the question is, can we do even better? Because this selective search algorithm is fixed, right? You, you don't learn anything. It's, it's a very predefined uh, algorithm already out there. Um, what people like to do is they like to take uh, you know, algorithms, numeric algorithms, and make it differentiable. And so uh, the same goes uh, in this case. Um, so we can replace the selective search with a neural network, and then we just learn the proposals or which regions uh, we want to propose uh, for the image to classify. Right? And so you know, instead of just running your selective search algorithm now, you just pass your feature maps into uh, what's called a region proposal network. Um, it's just a neural network. And then it's going to uh, output a bunch of, uh, I'd say, uh, regions of interest, right? And then you pass that into your classifier afterwards. And so it turns out by doing this, it's a lot faster because selective search is actually quite expensive of a uh, procedure. And oftentimes, like I said, it proposes a bunch of regions that have no objects in it. So it's a lot of wasted computation. Um, the question is, how do you compare? Um, this image uh, does a pretty good job explaining it. Our CNNs, it takes, it takes about 50 seconds per, per image uh, to just you know come up with the, the uh, bounding boxes and classification, which is not very good, especially you know if you want to use this real time, uh, which is often the case in like maybe self-driving cars. Um, fast RCN improves it by a lot. Uh, it reduces the time down to two seconds, and then faster RCN it reduces it even further uh, to 0 0.2 seconds per image, uh, which is a lot better. Right? And in terms of uh, performance accuracy, um, RCNN it achieves 66% on their data set. Um, fast RCNN and faster RCN actually does better. They get 66.9% each, uh, which is quite good. And now, you know, I did a lot of talking. I think we should just go over some coding uh, to introduce you guys into uh, with PyTorch and how you feel, you know, step foot into computer vision. Um, so uh, I have this Google Colab link, right? It has some code written for MNIST, um, and it's a very simple CNN uh, that I already implemented. Now, the challenge for you guys, if you guys want, it's totally optional, is you know implement either VGG, ResNet, or DenseNet, or honestly, any other model you could think of. It could be completely new. Um, it could be whatever you propose yourself, right? And the goal is to try um, to get it to run on CIFAR 10 and get a good accuracy, right? So the central question I have is, what are the differences of using RGB images than grayscale images, right? Obviously, um, for grayscale images, you're going to have to, it's only, uh, there's only one channel in the image, as opposed to RGB images, where there's three channels. Uh, but there's also a few other subtle differences. I hope, uh, hopefully you guys can spot them. But, you know, if you guys uh, would like to follow along, um, here is the, the code in this Google Colab. I, I guess I'll just go over it very briefly. Uh, to introduce you guys to what's going on here, uh, because uh, I'd say uh, quite a bit is going on. Um, in computer vision, you know, here we're going to use PyTorch. You can also use TensorFlow if you want, um, but this reading group hopefully will be more focused on PyTorch. Uh, the two main libraries you're going to be using uh, for computer vision is just PyTorch, so Torch, and also Torch Vision. Right? So you're going to install these. Um, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to define your CNN class, right? Uh, this is a, a subclass of the um, and then the dot modules, and in your init function, uh, you're just going to be defining your layers, right? So a typical convolutional layer is defined as nn dot com two d, uh, right? So what you do is you pass in the number of input channels, 
Uh, since we're dealing with MNIST, there's only one input channel, right? Since it's grayscale. And then we're going to uh, set some arbitrary number of output channels, right? I set it as six. And then we're going to define the kernel size, uh, which is uh, D, right? And this is going to be D by D. Um, in this case, I, I, I put a 5x5 five five kernel. Uh, people tend to use 3x3 three three kernels, right? And then you can also define these parameters, stride and pattern. I won't go into them. Uh, you can look more into them uh, because it's more nitty gritty, I'd say. After that, you know, we're going to define the batch norm and then mats pulling, right? So you do the same thing uh, like two times uh, to define your convolutional layers. So this neural network is very, uh, very basic, right? It only has two layers. Um, and then afterwards, since we're doing classification, we're going to have to uh, feed it through uh, uh, some linear layers, right? And so we define our linear layers here, right? So just the number of units, uh, right? So uh, 16 by 4 by 4, and then we're going to map it to 120 uh, units in the hidden layer. And then, you know, uh, the final layer it should map to uh, 10 hidden units, where each unit corresponds to a class, right? Because we have 10 classes. And so in your fourth function, um, you're just going to basically be calling uh, these, uh, these uh, attributes right here. Um, so it's very straightforward, right? And then you just return the final uh, image or the final feature uh, maps that you have. Uh, you're also going to want to introduce uh, data loaders, right? Um, these things that help you uh, uh, generate these images. Uh, if you're dealing with uh, classic data sets like MNIST, um, you know, CIFAR 10, uh, COCO, uh, PyTorch already, Torch Vision already uh, has, it, uh, has it implemented for you. So all you need to do is just do torchvision.datasets.mnist, right? Define where you want to store these images, um, you know, where you want to download them, and then some transformations. Oh, and just before I go any further, um, when you're dealing with computer vision, you're going to have to uh, do some pre-processing of your images, right? Because your images normally are of like JPEG, PNG formats, right? And so if you want to uh, use PyTorch on it, you're going to have to turn that into a PyTorch tensor. Um, that's very easy to do. All you have to do is uh, call this function transforms.toTensor, right? And then it turns your image into a PyTorch tensor. You can also add things like uh, rotation, uh, croppings, uh, jitter. Um, I'll give you guys some links afterwards to see where uh, you, uh, what the code is for that. Um, and hey, Jesse, I think the meeting is going to end in two minutes. So yeah. maybe you want to create like a new meeting and we can hop on that. Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll send you guys a new link in the reading group channel and then we'll all hop in. Um, for those, you know, uh, who don't want to stick around uh, any longer, uh, we're pretty much done. You know, here are some more links. Uh, for resources, you know, these are the page papers I mentioned, and then these are some additional resources that I might uh, that might be helpful for what I mentioned. Um, but yeah, for those who still want to stick around, you know, as I go through this code, uh, I'll add a new link into the reading group uh, channel in our Discord server. Cool. All right, uh, I'll stop presenting, and I'll see you guys in a bit. Oh, what's the channel called? Uh, right. So Google uh, needs. We'll wait like two more minutes. Really good uh, stuff, Jesse. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate I was, it. I was curious when um, uh, when was Celeb A that data set created? 
That's a great question. I think it was uh, created back in like 2017, 2018. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's pretty pretty recent. Yeah. Yeah, it's not used in like it's not used in the classical sense of you know uh, object detection. Uh, people right. use it a lot in like GANs and like generative right. models, um, because you don't use these labels as like conditioning variables. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I guess we'll just go ahead uh, since it looks like no one else is going to join. All right. Um, yeah, this should only take like pretty much five more minutes. Um, but yeah. Uh, right, you're gonna want to generate your uh, data loaders, um, and then we have the optimizers, right? So like SGD, uh, Atom, those are the two most commonly used ones. Um, right, you're basically just gonna want to create uh, an object, an optimizer object uh, for either one, right? Um, so then you have your test loop and then your train loop. Um, it's pretty straightforward, I'd say. You just iterate through your entire data set, um, right? And then uh, you, you take uh, you get the inputs and the labels, right? Uh, you feed it through your neural network, right? So all you have to do is just call net inputs. It implicitly calls the forward function um, if it's an n dot module class. Um, and then afterwards, uh, you get your predictions, right? You can perform your soft maths to compute the accuracy, uh, uh, and then perform uh, compute the maths. Um, and then afterwards, you pass it through uh, your loss function, compute the loss. Uh, you know, run back propagation on it, and then uh, you optimize uh, uh, optimize the model using uh, the gradients, right? So all of this code is pretty boilerplate. I'd say you can pretty much use it for any uh, task you want. Uh, that's uh, you know, obviously computer vision uh, classification related. Um, and yeah, lastly, in your pretty much, I'd say your main function, uh, you just want to uh, you know instantiate all of these. Objects, right? So you're gonna call your data loader function. It returns a train, uh, training loader and a test loader. Uh, you're gonna define your CNN. Um, here, you know, we we added dot CUDA um, in the back. Uh, and the reason why we do this is because if we want to use GPU training, uh, if we want to train our model on the GPU, we're gonna have to load all of the weights onto the GPU, right? And what dot CUDA does, it, it turns all of your weights into CUDA tensors, uh, which is exactly what you want. Um, right, you're gonna define your uh, your loss, your optimizers, and then you're gonna call your train function and your test function uh, at the end. Right, and so um, this is some boilerplate code um, for you guys to play around with. Uh, I guess for, like for for the take home project, what you guys really have to just worry about is you know uh, replace the CNN class with whatever model you want, um, and then also uh, get the data loader. Uh, function to return the CFAR10 data set or whatever data set you want to play around with honestly because it's already kind of implemented for you uh, in Torch Vision which is very cool. And lastly, you know, I can run this, it's in the train um, and it does quite well. Yeah, it, I achieved like 98% accuracy with just this simple model uh, which is quite surprising. Oh, invalid syntax. Uh, I should probably fix that in a bit. Um, but, you know, if you want to see how you guys compare against, you know, other people, um, there's actually a leaderboard out there for MNIST and CFAR10. Um, so uh, this is a really good web website, papersworthcode.com, and they have a lot of like leaderboards of data sets, um, right? So the uh, the best accuracy on the test set uh, right now is 99.87%, right? <laughs> Which is pretty much almost per perfect. And I'm actually surprised people are still uh, creating models uh, and testing it or evaluating on MNIST even to this day, right? This is all from 2020 and 2021. Uh, which, is, uh, which is quite surprising. Um, yeah, and then you, you can also find the leaderboard for CFAR 10, uh, which is right here. Right, so people already are achieving 99.5% accuracy, uh, which is pretty good. And if you look at here, um, <laughs> it looks like the best performing models these days are the transformer, the vision transformer models. Uh, so it's not like a CNN architecture anymore, uh, which is quite a shift in paradigm. I'd say um, so. That's quite exciting, and we'll definitely get more. Uh, we'll definitely talk about that in later sessions. Um, yeah, and I think that's pretty much it. Like I said, all of the papers that I mentioned can be found uh, on this slide here, and all of the additional resources can be found here. Um, you know, if you guys find any useful resources, um, any useful GitHub's, uh, feel free to post it in the uh, Computer Vision uh, channel. I want to bring that back to life because the last time I think someone messaged in it was like. A, was like almost a year ago or something like that. Um, 
And you know, uh, I will be updating this slide uh, with the later sessions, right? So you should just return to this uh, this link, uh, this Google slide link, uh, for all of the uh, uh, all of the sessions uh, in, uh, for in the future, all right? So I think that's all. Of, that's about it for me. Um, any questions? I'll be happy to take them. I'll stop recording.